Hello there, everybody. I am John Allen, the editor of Crux, and this is Last Week in the Church. Now, on the subject of last week, I kind of feel like we should be doing a Super Bowl wrap today, don't you? I mean, consider this. Tom Brady now has the exact same number of rings as the Catholic Church has sacraments. Uh, he grew up in an Irish Catholic household, very devout. He married his supermodel wife in a Catholic mass. I mean, there is a Catholic angle uh, on all of this. <clears throat> but I am not going to channel my inner sports fan today because I, I know that, that you are tuning in for Catholic Insight. So instead, here's what's on our rundown today. We're going to talk about a high-risk, high-reward Catholic, ma uh, ca sorry, a high-risk, high-reward Vatican trial, the foibles of founders, the Pope and women, the cultural dimension of reform, and finally, battles over Buffy. That's what's waiting for you on the other side, so please stick around. All right, we begin today with a high-risk, high-reward Vatican trial. This one centers on the pre-seminary of St. Pius X. As the name implies, a pre-seminary is something that comes before seminary. It's a facility for young men, usually middle school and high school age, uh, who are considering an eventual vocation to the priesthood. It gives them some spiritual formation, a taste of life and community, and so on. This one is located on Vatican grounds, uh, and its claim to fame is that it supplies all the altar boys for liturgies in St. Peter's Basilica. Now, the charge uh, is that between 2007 and 2012, one of those pre-seminarians who later became ordained a priest in 2017 in the Diocese of Como, a guy by the name of Father Gabriele Martinelli, sexually abused at least one other pre-seminarian who was a little younger than he was. They were both minors at the time. Uh, this came to light uh, around 2010 when the alleged victim in the case wrote a letter to the Diocese of Como. The Diocese of Como did its own investigation in 2013, concluded that the allegations were unfounded, that is, there was inadequate evidence to support them, went ahead and ordained uh, Martinelli in 2017. His current assignment is as the chaplain to a health care facility for elderly persons uh, in Como. Uh, the victim, unsatisfied with that response, uh, then wrote directly to Pope Francis. In 2019, Pope Francis decreed that there should be a Vatican trial to get to the bottom of this, uh, and that trial is currently ongoing. So this Wednesday, we had the uh, fourth hearing uh, in this trial. Uh, this one was devoted exclusively to hearing the testimony of the accused party, uh, that is, Father Martinelli. I should note, he's not the only accused party here. Father Enrico Radice, who was the rector of the pre-seminary during the time the abuse is alleged to have occurred, uh, is also on trial for basically what Americans would call obstruction of justice, that is, trying to sweep it under the rug. But the principal accused party is, of course, Martinelli. So in this hearing before the Vatican Tribunal on Wednesday, he strenuously denied all of the charges. Uh, what he claimed, actually, uh, is that he is being accused not because he did anything wrong, but as a byproduct of very ferocious internal divisions within the pre-seminary between basically traditionalists and progressives. Uh, he, he described a situation uh, in which there were some faculty with a strong following among the students who essentially rejected many of the reforms associated with the Second Vatican Council, preferring the pre-Vatican II Latin Mass, the so-called Tridentine Rite. Uh, he said his accuser, who in keeping with Italian and Vatican legal practice has not been identified uh, only by the initials LG, uh, he said his accuser at one point actually refused to serve the mass of a visiting bishop because the visiting bishop was going to use the post-Vatican II uh, new rite of the mass in the vernacular languages. Of course, the irony here is these young pre-seminarians who are so ferociously devoted to the pre-Vatican II mass weren't even alive 
uh, at the time that Vatican II uh, closed 56 years ago, but, but nevertheless apparently have strong feelings about it. Uh, Martinelli also claimed there was a parallel division within the pre-seminary over a plan backed by these traditionalists to open it up to university students, which would have, in effect, created a kind of parallel seminary formation uh, directed at more traditionalist uh, type future priests um, and as a kind of rival to the formation that would occur in standard Italian seminaries using post-Vatican II liturgies, post-Vatican II concepts, and so on. Uh, now, here's why this is high risk, high reward. The risk is obvious. What this trial is doing is tearing the lid off internal divisions in a pre-seminary that are hardly confined to that pre-seminary. I mean, we all know that there is a rift in the Catholic Church. There has been for almost the last 60 years between those who are in favor of the reforms unleashed by the Second Vatican Council and those opposed to it. Now, that's no secret. It's just the Vatican doesn't usually like to air that kind of thing. Uh, you know, what we're getting a picture of uh, is a seminary where the faculty were at each other's throats. The, the, the pre-seminarians uh, had, had sort of split into rival camps. Not a particularly pretty picture. Um, and further, if it is eventually determined that the accusations are correct, then of course we also have a form of sexual abuse occurring right under the Pope's nose at a time between 2007 and 2012 when the first wave of reforms intended to combat sexual abuse in the church were already rolled out. So that too is not a particularly edifying scenario. Now the reward here is uh, if this trial is perceived as fully transparent and if whatever verdict it reaches is perceived as credible, then Pope Francis and his team are going to get enormous credit for meaning what they say when they pledge themselves to transparency and accountability. Uh, the, the irony, of course, is the risk comes up front. The risk is unfolding right now. The reward is down the line, depending on how things shake out. So it's a kind of pay now, get your purchase later uh, sort of deal. Uh, and we will, of course, have our eyes on it to see how it plays out. All right, uh, our second headline from this week, the foibles of founders this week. The leadership of Aid to the Church in Need, which is a papally founded charitable organization uh, intended to support suffering Christians around the world, uh, was forced to acknowledge that the founder of the organization, a legendary Dutch priest by the name of Verenfried von Straten, uh, had been accused of attempted rape uh, of an employee, a female employee of the organization in 1973. These allegations came to light so many years later. The alleged victim uh, in the case was actually paid 16,000 euro by aid to the church in need to compensate her for her suffering, which certainly implies the organization found this accusation to be credible. It was also communicated to Vatican officials, specifically Cardinal Mauro Piacenza, who at the time was the prefect for the Congregation of Clergy, which has a responsibility uh, for this organization. Uh, and Piacenza essentially ordered the allegation to be covered up. Uh, that is, it was not supposed to be made public. Uh, apparently, Piacenza was concerned that the good work the organization is doing could be compromised or tainted uh, by negative revelations about the founder, obviously not really in keeping with the spirit of transparency that Pope Francis has tried to inject. We should note Cardinal Piacenza is no longer the prefect of the Congregation for Clergy. Von Straten therefore becomes uh, merely the most recent founder of a major Catholic organization to be accused of some form of abuse, whether it's sexual or financial or abuses of power. I mean, consider uh, Father Marcial Maciel de Golada, the founder of the Legion of Christ, uh, who was sentenced to a life of prayer and penance by the Vatican uh, in 2006 over allegations of sexual abuse of young priests uh, and also seminarians. 
uh, and also financial misconduct and a number of other things. Uh, there is Luis Fernando Figari, uh, the founder of the Sodalitium of Christian Life in Peru, uh, who was forced to step down. The organization had to acknowledge allegations of abuse uh, against him. More recently, the legendary Jean Vanier, founder of the L'Arche community. L'Arche was forced to acknowledge uh, that Vanier had committed sexual abuse against six women uh, during the period from 1975 to 2000, certainly taints his legacy. Uh, just within the last few days, Enzo Bianchi, the legendary founder of the ecumenical community of Bose, was actually kicked out of his own residence uh, because the Vatican had determined that he had been guilty of abuses of power even after stepping down as the leader of Bose. And now, sort of like Napoleon in Elba, uh, has been sent into exile. Uh, and von Straten now takes his place in that company. What that really captures for us is the problem with founders uh, of new movements, new entities in Catholic life. Now, you know, what tends to happen, the phenomenology of these organizations is that a, a very strong cult of personality emerges around the founder because uh, that founder is the person who gave life uh, to a new movement, who gave it its charism, its identity. Uh, inevitably, so much uh, about that outfit is tied up with the personality and the biography uh, of the founder. Now, of course, this has always been the case. I mean, there was probably a cult of personality around Dominic Guzman in the early days of the Dominicans, around Ignatius of Loyola in the early days of the Jesuits. But the difference is that in, in those uh, historical periods, when mobility was limited, when there was no mass communication, there was no social media, these new movements, so to speak, you know, they, they would be small for a very long period of time. They grew only gradually, in some cases over decades or centuries, which meant there was a lot of time to separate the wheat from the chaff. Uh, today, of course, with the ease of moving around, with the ability to galvanize a mass audience almost instantaneously, these new movements can spring up virtually overnight. And it is only later that we, we begin to realize that in some cases, the founders, the driving forces of these outfits had feet of clay. Uh, the Vatican may be forced on the back of all of this uh, to institute certain reform measures. I mean, for instance, if a new movement in the Catholic Church gets papal recognition, uh, that is, it's entered on the official register of papally recognized movements, the Vatican may need to think about, for instance, making it uh, mandatory that within five years of that recognition, there will be an apostolic visitation to find out what's actually going on uh, inside that community. Maybe they'll need to decree term limits for founders. That is, you know, within five or 10 years after that recognition, they're gonna have to step down and make way for somebody else. I mean, we don't know what these reforms will look like, but it certainly seems that the von Straten story in tandem with all these other cases uh, has illustrated that there is a problem uh, with founders of new movements, new organizations in the church, and some kind of accountability measures will have to be imposed. All right, our third headline, the Pope and women. So within the last week, Pope Francis has named two women to positions of authority in the Vatican. Uh, Zavarian's sister, uh, Natalie Berquart, uh, she's French, uh, has been named as the new undersecretary of the Senate of Bishops. The importance of that is that she becomes the first woman with voting rights uh, in a Senate of Bishops. He also named uh, a veteran Italian lawyer by the name of Katia Samaria to the all-important position of promoter of justice for the appeals court in the Vatican which means she will be the prosecutor on all appeals of convictions in the Vatican's criminal justice system. Uh, right away, uh, the case that is waiting for her has to do with Angelo, uh, Angelo Caloia, the former president of the Vatican Bank, recently convicted by the Vatican's lower court of fraud. He's appealed, which means that Samaria right away steps into a high profile and politically sensitive prosecution. Now, 
The thing is, neither of these positions are simply token appointments. These are positions with real authority. You will remember that from the very beginning, Pope Francis said that even though women's ordination to the priesthood is off the table, that that door was closed by St. John Paul II and is going to remain closed, that he wanted to find other ways to empower women within the system. Well, for eight years, people sort of wondered, what does that mean? They, they, they didn't see too many examples of it. If I can date myself, the American question many people were asking was, where's the beef? Well, ladies and gentlemen, here's the beef. I mean, these two women have been appointed to real jobs of real authority with real consequence. Uh, you know, we, we don't know how this is going to play out, but it certainly suggests that Pope Francis was in earnest, even if it took him a little bit of time to get around to the payoff. All right, fourth, the cultural dimension of reform, in this case, financial reform. The Vatican recently has been rocked by a series of financial scandals and embarrassments. I mentioned the Kaloya conviction, which is merely the most recent example. There is another case playing out right now. Uh, it involves Archbishop Ettore Balestrero, uh, who was, not so long ago, the number three official in the Vatican's Secretary of State. He was the Undersecretary for Relations with State. Uh, he then went on to become the Apostolic Nuncio, that is the papal ambassador in Colombia. He currently is the papal ambassador in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, what's been alleged uh, is that Archbishop Balestrero was part of a money laundering scheme uh, along with his dad and his brother. Uh, his dad ran uh, an import-export company, the allegation, uh, is that somewhere in the 90s, uh, the dad basically violated European law on how much beef you could export from out or you could import from outside the Eurozone. Apparently imported a lot of Argentinian beef that was wildly in excess of European limits on such things. Uh, and through a, a, you know, circuitous, almost Byzantine series of transactions attempted to disguise uh, that income, to, to launder it. Uh, and at one stage, that money allegedly passed through accounts belonging to Archbishop Balestrero and was then eventually paid off to his brother. Now, Archbishop Balestrero has denied uh, all of this. Uh, he has insisted that uh, the money that he transferred to his brother's account was simply a kind of down payment on their inheritance from the dad, uh, that he had no idea anything untoward was going on. I should add that in this case, this is not a Vatican trial. It's a trial, a civil trial uh, in, in the city of Genoa, uh, where the dad's company was based. Now, what all this illustrates is that the obstacles that Pope Francis faces in his campaign for, for financial reform aren't just outright blatant illegality and corruption. I mean, if that's all he had to deal with, then simply passing new laws and appointing new prosecutors would be the end of it. But the truth of it is, in the Balestretto case, much like the case of Italian Cardinal Angelo Becciu, who was recently fired by the Pope, essentially, over allegations that he was funneling money to outfits run by his brothers in his native Sardinia. This involves an attempt uh, basically to support one's family, an unwillingness to ask critical questions about where family money comes from, and also an attempt to support family members in their efforts to make a living. Now, family solidarity, taking care of one's family, is considered a defining national virtue here in Italy. Uh, I mean, it is the furthest thing from a vice. Uh, Italians, particularly of Becciu and Balestrero's uh, generation, were brought up on the idea that other than one's duty to God, there is no higher duty than to one's family. Uh, and, and so, you know, while these actions may or may not be criminal under civil and Vatican law, regardless of that, they may not really meet the classic Catholic test of sin, of subjective sin, 
which is knowing intent to do wrong. Both Pechu and Balestrero may well have felt that whatever the fine points of the law was, what was going on here was their family needed something from them and they wanted to come through. And that's the cultural dimension of all of this. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the Pope wants to inject transparency. He wants to inject accountability. No one on principle is going to argue against any of that, but he is up against a set of cultural assumptions here that make the effort to achieve real transparency and real accountability more difficult because those, however virtuous they may seem, they are considered lower virtues than the obligation of solidarity with the family. Uh, and so the challenge here is not simply, uh, you know, uh, flipping a switch, uh, decreeing a new law. It's cutting through cultural assumptions and cultural patterns of behavior here in Italy that have been formed over centuries, if not millennia. Uh, and if you ever wonder why financial reform takes so long, why it appears so difficult, and, and why despite a blizzard of new laws and alleged reform measures, we continue to hear about scandals and breakdowns and embarrassments, look, if Rome wasn't built in a day, Rome can't be reformed in a day either uh, because you are not just dealing with issues of law, you are dealing with issues of culture. That's going to take some time to cut through and reshape. All right, finally, battles over Buffy. I don't know about you, uh, but I have always been a huge fan of the TV show Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, I just thought it was brilliant. Uh, and most of its brilliance came from its creator and executive producer, a guy by the name of Josh Whedon. If you ever saw the episode of Buffy that they did as a musical, consider that Josh Whedon, just out of his own brain one day, came up with the idea for that, wrote the lyrics to all of the numbers uh, that they performed, and simply walked into the writer's meeting one day, plunked it down and said, you know, here's next week's episode. I mean. The guy is a genius, but uh, by multiple accounts, while he may be a genius, he doesn't seem to be a particularly nice human being. Uh, Josh Whedon has faced accusations of abusive behavior before, but the new twist uh, is that he's also facing charges of blatant anti-Catholicism. Uh, one of the actresses on the show, uh, by the name of Carissa Carpenter, uh, she played Cordelia, who, if you know the show, that was Zach's love interest, um, and just one of the real fun characters in the show. Uh, apparently, at one point during the run of the show, uh, she became pregnant uh, with her husband uh, and was brought in by Josh Whedon, uh, asked point blank if she was going to get an abortion, uh, and then when she said she wouldn't, in part because of her Catholic beliefs, she claims, uh, she was mocked and belittled by Whedon for that. Uh, and the next season, after she gave birth to her child, uh, she was essentially fired and written out of the show. Uh, and she claims that during that period, during the, the sort of end game of her time on the show, there was a kind of running acidic, acerbic stream of commentary from Whedon about various things, but also including uh, her Catholic beliefs. Uh, now, I think the moral of this story, let, let's go back to our earlier segment about the foibles of founders. Whedon himself was a sort of founder, not of a Catholic movement, but of a brilliant TV series uh, that brought entertainment, happiness, even joy, uh, to the millions of people who watched it, myself included. But this is a reminder that however charismatic, however brilliant, however inspirational one of these founders may be, that does not insulate them against the potential for vice and sin. Uh, now, of course, we only have Carpenter's word for uh, Whedon's anti-Catholicism, although it should be said that a number of other alumni of the show have also come forward on Carpenter's behalf to say that they had experienced other forms of abusive behavior from Whedon. Uh, all of this, I think, just puts an exclamation point on the case for accountability. Uh, that, you know, none of us uh, are above the possibility 
uh, a failure, even, it's, even at times grotesque and spectacular failure. Uh, and the only way to guard against the toxic consequences uh, of those sorts of failures is to be held accountable. No one, either in the church or in the wider world, should be considered above the law or, or above uh, inspection, uh, above review. Uh, you know, as, as President Ronald Reagan famously said, trust but verify. Uh, that was good for the start uh, talks uh, and nuclear disarmament negotiations with the Soviet Union, I would suggest it is probably also good both in the life of the Catholic Church and also Hollywood. Trust but verify. All right, folks, that is our show for this week. If you like this show, if you like Last Week in the Church, please uh, give us a like, give us a share, Get on those social media platforms, your platform of choice. Uh, tell other people about it. Go forth and make disciples of all the nations. Spread the word, because that's how we build our audience and ensure the longevity uh, of this program. Uh, I would also remind you that full coverage uh, of all of these stories is available on the Crux site. That is cruxnow.com, cruxnow.com, your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic commentary. We are currently in the middle of our online fund drive, and so if you are so inclined, uh, we would be deeply grateful for any support you can offer. We are not asking for very much. Maybe what you would spend this month on a couple cups of coffee or streaming a movie someplace. Uh, but anything you can do uh, would be of great help. It would allow us to maintain our independence, which is our calling card, our stock in trade. Uh, but while independence is great, it is not free. Uh, we have to pay for it. We need your help. All right, we will see you next week at this time. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week, and we will talk to you again soon.